Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the start of a new campaign in TNO, the last season of Europe, in which we're playing as Samara. Now, I've got a cool flag, and if you'd like to read about the Committee for the Liberation of the Peoples of Russia, please go right ahead. And here's the next paragraph. And here's the next paragraph. And there we go. For the most part. Oh, yep, there we go. Cool. Determines who shall win the power struggle to be the successor of Vlasov in the ROA. Finish what the Germans could not do and destroy the WRF once and for all. Show the world the perils of underestimating the so-called traitorous dogs of the ROA. But I've already set things up off screen, as you can tell. And we have no manpower, which is good. Totally love it. But our guide. As yet another year rolls on, our guide Andre Vlasov continues his Sisyphean uh, re reconquest effort. Whatever power he gathers, his underling steel, whatever legitimacy he possesses, the Germans bombing strip away. A sad man grows older, buried under the weight of history and the judgment of those outside his borders, yet he has not given up for the upcoming troubles and Germany may signal his one last chance. For now, his greatest quality is that he is able to maintain an, in a coalition. Maintain a coalition. The various generals like him, uh, better than they have like one another, and the people have found his rule fair, if not particularly noteworthy. They are there are worse places in Russia than Samara, certainly, but if Vlasov wants to serve as a guide to renew Russia, he must begin anew his consolidation of military and popular support. So why are we playing Samara? Well, eventually I'm going to play every single warlord that has a unique focus tree in Russia and TNL. And additionally, someone on my Discord server wanted me to play Samara, so I said, sure, why not? <clears throat> the mod we're using, though, as you saw a little bit just a moment ago, uh, disabled us or disable the ability for us to see the state gesture tool mod, which is one of the mod re mods we're using. We're using player peace conferences, just because I leave it on all the time. I don't even do it, anything with it. And as well as, obviously, TNO. But let's do our voice. Our consolidation effort goes through Mitilti Zykov. Zykov is difficult to describe, for much of his past is cloaked in mystery. Few claim to know where he comes from. The man himself claims to have been a leading ideologue in the opposition to the Soviet government, and he has indeed shown himself to be a highly talented public speaker on, or, and propagandist. His efforts to reach the people of Russia in general, and some in particular, have done much to generate what few shreds of good reputation we possess. Zikov is among the greatest advocates of freedom and democracy in our office of court and has built himself a small clique around this position. His aim is not merely to free Russia from both warlordism and from the Germans, but to bring forth a new, carefully supervised democracy. To many militarists in our government, he is a soft man. To a German loyalist, he is a de decadent parasite intent on betraying our German benefactors. Few are sure where Zikov comes from, and few can claim to know where his real endgame is. But at the critical juncture, his skills and propaganda are irreplaceable. We need his voice as the army of liberation marches forward. The old man, but to let you know, I have not done this or play this off screen at all. I don't know what's going to happen, even though with our position, it's not that bad. Vlasov, 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 and we also have Tukhachevsky, Ivan Tukhachevsky, Ivan Tukhachevsky, and Ilya Ostrovsky. Ostrovsky. And let's take a look. If you like, like to read about the modern Bogadir, please go right ahead. I read that like like six times already, but it happens in every campaign, so. There we go. Uh, let's see. Literacy is going down. Research facilities, agriculture, poverty is increasing, which is not good. But we'll deal with that. Industrial expertise is going down. Other than that, it's not terrible. So, the old man. Ovalasov's aides walked constantly to and fro from the man's office, the tidal nature of the movement echoing the old man's current situation. Even in these desperate times, few could stomach working directly for the traitor general himself. Those that managed to either ignore or muster indifference towards the accusations against Vlasov found themselves buried in drudgery, bored out of their wits instead of merely disgusted by the scent of treason. Better, perhaps, to pray for an assignment on the border instead where death and starvation dispel the lethargy. Vlasov stood on political quicksand, his position shifting and changing by the day but never improving. Some of his aides suspected that the old man would prefer being genuinely hated by his generals instead of the current indifference. In the college of traitors that filled the ROA's upper echelon, Vlasov was not particularly liked, but nor was he disliked. Whatever coalition and common ground he tried to build usually disintegrated within the month. But if the old guard or old general could not be liked by everyone, he could at least be tried to gin up love and hatred within specific factions. Under him, Zikov's Democrats constantly agitated against Oktan's war profiteers. In between, schemed the officers committee, General Boniachenko at their puppet. Vlasov had long pondered on which factions cast his full and hollowed weight behind. His, his remaining scraps of authority would tip the balance now that the time for decision had come. The general's own aide could 
scarcely guess which side Vlasov would choose, nor how the ROA's future would play out as a result. The Trader General is not yet done. Separated from the family. Sitting beside the ruins of the hut, Sasha had struggled in an attempt to hear her compa compatriots or companions. She had lost an ear to the shrapnel of the bomb that had destroyed the structure, and with only one remaining, she was having difficulty determining exactly where the sounds were coming from. Scarred and alone, she wanted nothing more than to once again hear the laughter and banter that so often occupied both the structure and the fire pit outside it. The laughter that would always follow a long day of hunting and tracking, when she would be congratulated by the hunters for expertly leading them through the dense brush. Sasha waited there all day, confident that the hunters would must return. She had always been faithful to them, and she could not fathom the idea that they would not show faith in return. E evening came, and she remained, curling as much as possible for warmth. Night fell, she remained, watching the curious eyes of the many other predators inspected from her tree line. When morning arrived on the second day, hunger came with it, and Sasha knew that her friends were not coming back. That was that there was no reason to stay here any longer, and she needed a hunt besides. But she had not forgotten her friends, and she knew that wherever they were, they could not have forgiven, forgotten her. So she knew she had to go find them, and so she stood on all fours and began walking towards the tree line. A dog, a day in a dog's life. I really, have, I think I might have read this before. I thought this was actually a girl or a guy, because you know Sasha, their name is sometimes a guy for Russian. But uh, like I thought it was, I really thought it was a girl or you know a, a person. Whew. Anyways, that's the national spirits. We have the Luftwaffe terror uh, bombing campaign. We've got the German bootlickers. Oh boy. We have the Smolensk manifesto. And we have the German military training, but a new factory for old guns. But let's, ooh, Assassin's Strike to Hitler, cool. Uh, turncoat General, of course. And we have low military morale. And also for national spirits, we have low civilian morale, as well as ne negligible corruption, which is, mostly spirits aren't very good for us. But, Armaments Factory number 14 was a small complex near the Samara Rail Yards. Repurposed by the ROA itself during the darkest days of terror bombing, the small shack was soon shut up, built up, or set up. The factory, in reality, was more than a little large building with a long, few wooden tables and a number of machine tools, was dedicated to taking apart German small arms and reverse engineering them for our own purposes. Vlasov and most of the under him knew well that their German support would eventually run out, and they long made provisions to ensure that the myriad of German equipment from Car 98Ks to SG44s remained operable even once it was no longer possible to receive their parts from their former benefactors, neither officially nor through smugglers. The factory rarely worked during the day. The bombings made it hard to. But workers toiled all night with small headlamps and minimal light, disassembling old or well-worn rifles in their respective ammo. These workers, despite their rugged condition, were not civilians, not officially at least. They were engineers, not just employees of the ROA, but members of it and experienced in handling German weapons for many years, until recently. The factory had been minimally of staff, however, with the increasing amount of bloody victories won by the ROA. The soldiers at the front line needed more and more weapons, and the number of of those that we can get from the German smugglers is becoming minuscule compared to our needs. As such, Armaments Factory Number 14 has of recently expanded not only in terms of manpower but location as well. A number of shoddily constructed buildings have been added to the original to form a sort of complex where dedicated stations and senior engineers act as efficiency generating machines. As of late, the factory is no longer just re reverse engineering weapons but producing their own versions of them. Certainly not with the workmanship of the originals. They were cheap and easy to produce, and that's what the High Command wanted. The beast of industry rears its ugly and uh, beautiful head. Not its ugly head. It's a beautiful head. And one of my favorite things about these Russian warlords is scavenging for loot and beating other people up for their goods. <sighs> it reminds me of Victoria, too. But I'll general. There's, there's a theory in hierarchy to the National Liberation Army. We'll blast off at the top and the range of officers near, neatly arrayed below them. In practice, however, the opinion of the officer corps as a whole is critical to our endeavors. The officer corps and his committee has a champion in Sergei Bonachenko, a former Soviet officer. Bonachenko was captured by the Germans in the Second World War and thrown into a penal colony for his troubles. Oh, hey, Oh, boy. Few in Russia mourned his fate as he was widely blamed by the Soviet leadership for losing several critical battles in the opening stages of the war. In the dark days of the West Russian War, Bonachenko was offered a way out of his jail sentence, join the Russian Army of National Liberation and crush and push the WRRF back. Angry at the Soviet leadership and des desperate to leave his prison, Bonachenko agreed and quickly rose to the ranks of the National Liberation Army. Bonachenko was widely seen as a capable officer, beloved by the men for standing up to their ideas. For their ideas. The, Russian, the general cares lit for little but the reunification of Russia and the annihilation of the Soviet remnant, and most of all the downfall of Germany and the monthly shipment. One of the oddest phenomena in territory control by the ROA was a small train station about an hour's march from the city of Samara. Previously a small stop from West Russia to the city, the station's real name had long been replaced by another. The Kantoraban station, as it was known now, was one of the last stops for German smugglers, Reichskommissariat Muscovy and garrison members who were paid too little to justify the risks they took. These smugglers, who brought with them just about anything a Russian soldier could dream of, made lucrative deals with the local garrisons to sell them things from tobacco and tea to chocolate and small mementos. Any luxury products that managed to trickle their way into German-occupied Russia were made available 
to the ROA soldiers. It was one of the largest benefits of signing on with ROA. Simply put, their old contacts with the Germans had allowed them to afford a few more luxuries than their ideological rivals. As both the Germans and Russians worked to offload the goods from the train, they chatted with one another in broken fragments of their respective tongues, each side having made clear to learn the other's language. One of the Russians asked a German about his family. I don't know, honestly, he responded. They're back in Prussia. I've heard that there's not much in the way of work, but other than that, there's been no word. The German wanted to be courteous, it's responding kind. What about here? What's life in, like in Samara? The Russian chuckled a little bit. I wouldn't know. I haven't seen the city in weeks. This is my first time being remotely close to it. Border patrols, skirmishes with bandits. I'm sure you're familiar. Contraband station was an inc incredibly strange site for the cultural inter intermingling. The Russian soldiers didn't like the German counterparts who supplied the contraband, and they were confident that the Germans felt the same about them. And yet, the Russians attempted to learn German, and the Germans tried their best, or tried their hand, at learning Russian. Everyone knew each other's names, food was shared, and jokes were even made at the language barrier impeded communication at times, ultimately. Both sides were a part of each other's lives, and both accepted that fact, even if they didn't like those that the fact was made up of. A strange glint in humanity in this dark land. Uh, what do we have over here? Smuggling shipments. Uh, we, we don't need to do this one. Reunification of Russia. We're not, definitely not going to get to that in this episode. Maybe by the next episode, maybe, but look at this. Smuggling operations. Our boy, so. Welcome, welcome. Zyakov and had his bodyguard Usher and Vlasov's aide firmly holding on to the general's package. It is good to see you. We never hear enough from our commander Vlasov. The, other, the ever energetic propagandist of the ROA held a hazy position in his ar army's leadership. Well, not officially on the officer's committee, Mitle Zikov had wormed his way into a comfortable office in Samara's principal headquarters. Supporters of this faction could be seen streaming in, in and out various times. A few stacks of pamphlets rested on the office's varied furniture. Zikov almost yanked the package from his aide's hand after a swift introduction and began leafing through it, whistling all the while. Interesting, interesting, were the propagandist's only comments. For his troubles, Lasov's aide was given a new package. Bring it to your boss, all right? Zykov said with characteristic cheer. Moments later, the aide found himself escorted back outside. The stream of visitors has brought even more officers through the corridor, all waiting for a chance to speak with Zykov. None of them appeared too surprised to see one of Vlasov's own aides coming out of the office, expecting the commander to keep in touch with his own prime propagandist. Still, some looks followed him through the corridor, with Zykov's voice ringing out from behind the closed doors. Menshikov, you handsome dude, what's the news? Does Zykov's energy know no bounds? Probably. So... Many of uh, Oktan's men are notoriously corrupt, however. They do not get us, they do get us the best gear. We could try to rid ourselves of them, but this would markedly limit the amount of arms we could smuggle in from the German Rex Commissariats. 100% normal, more efficiency, corruption in our system, civilian morale, military morale. Ooh. Increase corruption, increase the variety of goods, bribe German officers, increase corruption. Okay, so that's kind of cool. I like this stuff as well. I really do like this stuff. Zatas, I'm not interested in, and let's see. I kind of want to save our political power. I really would like to get maybe secure control so we get some more stability. Uh, smuggling shipment. 50 years of infantry commit. Corruption. Well, we could try, right? Bribe German officers. Contact German soldiers. Let's expand the network. By a large amount, large amount, large amount. So, negligible, 15%, whatever. Oh, wow. Investigate corruption. D decrease corruption. Dis how... What does corruption do? How bad is it for us? I, I, oh, I have no idea. So increase civilian morale. I like that. Actually, we're probably to do this. Ooh, additional. Ooh, additional anti-tank? We get more guns? Decrease corruption. Uh, I don't want to do that one. Ooh. I, I want to definitely maybe increase civilian morale. Let's take a look here. Civilian morale is low. I want to increase that because we get more political power. M military morale sucks. So, but... Low civilian morale is... I want to get more political power. Currently, we get how much? 0.64. I would like to get more. So, we'll get some luxury goods for the civilians, and then maybe we'll decrease corruption by a small amount. There we go. And their puppet. Mikhail Oktan is a hard man to his supporters and a broken man to others. He has little sympathy for the communist regime, defeated twice in 15 years by the Germans. He is not a monarchist or a democrat, for the weakness of these past regimes has brought Russia into the shackles of the failed communist regime. The Germans have become the masters of Europe, and what of it? For Oktan and his supporters, Berlin has crushed every Jewish regime that has obscured man's progress. Vlasov and his ilk might see the Germans as a means to an end, but Oktan knows better. He sees Vlasov as a broken, pathetic man squirming to get out of the from under the German shadow. <clears throat> Octan is having to collaborate with Germany. He sees no greater purpose in helping to enforce the German will upon the ruins of the Soviet Union. And his eager collaboration has let him secure many contacts in Mexico, Messiah, Muscovy, and beyond. Octan might be a hard man or a broken man, but he is certainly a dangerous man. An essential one, for through him, Samara secures essential supplies from the German ogre. <coughs> my apologies. I keep having to clear my voice for some reason. It only happens when I play TNO. <coughs> So, let's go... Oh, I want... Oh, we need more stability, though. 
Ooh. Ooh, we only 31. Investigate corruption by a large amount. That's usually better to do a large amount. I want to go ahead and do this, though. Let's see if we can do luxury goods. Decrease corruption by a small amount. All right, so. Luxury goods. 20%. It's still low. Does that change anything? No, but we're going to raise it up eventually. Our general. It was unusual for Bulnachenko to request private delivery of messages. Usually the officer committee read and responded to all of Vlasov's community keys, leaving Bulnachenko not particularly involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the faction he normally led. Hence how surprisingly he was him to bother reading Vlasov's communications. <clears throat> the general locked the door behind the A before setting back or sitting back at his office. The room was austere with no luxury other than a small furnace in one corner. The aide waited as the general read through a few of the sets of documents. One paper in particular gave the general pause. The aide recognized Lasov's signature at the bottom. Bunachenko read the letter a few times before sternly looking up. Who else knows about the contents of this bundle of documents, soldier? Only I am Vlasov, sir. Good, and you are dismissed. Bunachenko crumpled the letter in a ball and threw it in his furnace before unlocking the door. Like that, the aide found himself back in the corridor, empty, save for the faint sound of fire, consuming. Special correspondence between Bunachenko and Vlasov? Hmm, peculiar. Wait, uh... Oh, wait, we already have two loot. Nice. Equipment time. And what do we have here? Orenberg? Or the Polish? Oh, boy. They still have no unique focus here yet. They will. I'm more than certain they will. Uh, three divisions versus three divisions. Well, these guys have only light infantry, so Orenberg. Oh, they're going to be getting raided, maybe. Uh, do you have any upgrades for these guys? Curious Origins. Nope. A slight breeze blew through the city of Samara. Simeon, Simeon, uh, patrolled the city. A sharp eye trained on a passerby, some of whom glared at him impotently, some of whom just tried to avoid attracting his attention. It didn't matter, Simeon, so long as he didn't try anything funny. Hey, Simeon, Simeon, over here! He turned to face the source of the voice, and an eyebrow rose in an annoyance, an annoyed surprise at the familiar face running towards him. Ah, General Bunachenko ordered that no soldier patrol alone for the time being. One of our own got badly beaten by dissidents. I volunteered to join you, seeing as we're old friends. Fyodor explained. Uh, having no way of knowing their friendship was not mutual, as they began to walk t together despite Simeon's reluctance, Fyodor's latest topic of conversation got Simeon's interest for once. By the way, Simeon, I've think, been thinking about this thing for a while, but <clears throat> don't you think it's weird? Bunachenko's a Ukrainian, yet he's prominent over here instead. Frowning, Simeon scratched his chin in confusion. What's so odd about a Ukrainian in Russia? It's not just him, Fyodor quickly assured him. Old man Kromiadis, a Greek down from the Caucasus, and Bayersky. As a genuine Pole, Fyodor's voice began to grow hushed. Nobody really knows anything about Oktan either, and there are all kinds of rumors swirling about. The most common seems to be that he's a Croat, a Serb, something like that, and a son of a Balkan baron. And there's Zikov, who's admits he's a Ukrainian and nothing else. I've heard a few rumors that he's a Jew, but before we could get, his, get anything else out, Fyodor found his mouth covered by Simeon's hand. It'd be a lie to say that, like, that he liked the annoying gossip at all, but just hearing something like that could place people in danger. Fyodor, perhaps it's wise if we moved on to another topic of conversation, with the withering glare from Simeon. I'm saying his name right. The rest of the patrol was conducted in silence. Some stories are best left uncovered or undiscovered. It never ends in unpredictable, at unpredictable intervals. The planes arrive overhead. Sometimes their destination is further into the Russian interior. At others, however, they loop over Samara to drop their payloads, screaming into the air. Its frequency left unpredictable. No one can get used to the random terror bombings. They can be merely endured. And yet the winds of change might still be blowing. Or Germany to fall in control of its own. Perhaps these might be the last months of the cursed terror bombings, as such. An officer's conference have been gathered to discuss how to best prepare for the upcoming window of opportunity. Various factions make their case of lots of and their officers. In the meantime, the regular salvaging operations and efforts continue. Building towers down by the war machine, see their components move to new places. Supply convoys used as target practice are pushed out of the road so others may pass. Life in Russia, of course, continues on. Our puppet master. Vlasov's aide was guided to Oktan's office by the two stern bodyguards. There, a boss up in an office, reading reports and documents from across the border of the Reich in between puffs of smoke. Ever, the, ever genial. The general stood up to greet Vlasov's envoy with a handshake. <clears throat> Can I invite you to indulge in some tobacco? Fresh arrival from our western neighbor. The aide glanced at the box of expertly rolled cigarettes. It had been so long since he had a proper smoke. The thought of owning something to Octon however, no matter how insignificant, gave the aide some pause. Still, good tobacco was good tobacco. Thank you, Commander. The aide placed on Octon's desk the package he had been tasked to bring and then helped himself to a few cigarettes. Octon smiled. I've heard good things about you, soldier. If you find yourself looking to carry out a couple of favors, please come visit me. I've had no greater concern than my men's quality of life. A tempting offer for sure. The aide nodded again to Octon and followed the guards back outside. One of them offered a light. The aide walked back to the Vlasov's offices, savoring the rare pleasures of good tobacco. It had been months, if not years. Perhaps owning Octon was not so bad after all.
with the Iron Harvest. Harvest days are what they were called around these parts. ROA soldiers would descend upon the town under the full battle dress and proceed to help the local farmers with their harvest, providing the valuable manpower that their fields desperately needed, especially since so many of their sons had been conscripted or killed. When the harvest days had been first put in place, there was little trust or goodwill between the soldiers and villagers, especially considering one of the reasons that the soldiers helped out with the harvest was to take some of the food back with them. But as the harvest days became more regular, the village became more acclimatized, acclimated to the presence of the ROA, they begin to see them not as German collaborators, but as protectors. <coughs> Excuse me. Woo! The atmosphere changed. Trust was built between civilian and soldier. Eventually, some members of the ROA even began volunteering for the harvest days, usually conscripts who had a background in agriculture, hoping to be assigned to one. On some of the friendly villages, even offering to feed the soldiers during the day, it was a relatively comfortable excitement compared to border patrols or anti band operations. While well, the Committee for the Liberation of the Russian Peoples was far from popular, they had been working hard to secure the regime, distancing themselves from the Germans, and even improve their relations with those that they ruled over. These harvests were a key part of that, and contributed to a large to the image that the ROA was there to help, not hurt. To a large extent, it seemed that that was working. No one liked taxes, especially when they were being extracted in the form of food, but oftentimes after the harvest, many of the farmers would stare jealously at the ROA's trucks as they pulled away from the village, wishing they had been able to keep more of the food they had had grown. However, on the whole, it was a positive experience. The soldiers have been eff effective in getting a few local boys and restless, restless farmhands to sign up with ROA, which further helped dissipate tensions with the locals. Most of the core of the ROA had no local ties to the areas around Samara, and having patrols protect these or protect those that they knew was a huge boon for the KONR's propaganda machine. Where did I put my sickle? In my enemy. That's where you put it, and I have a cup of coffee here that I've been drinking from so far. And right now, I'm literally just waiting for to get 20 command power, so we can go ahead and raid and get some more loot. Artsezo. Dimitri Zakutny. Fyodor Trushkin. Trukin. Trukin. Probably. Oh, wow, that's not good. All right, so what do we got? Uh, the Poles. I guess it's Polish time. We do have five divisions, so I'm not too worried about this. Let's see if we can beat up some Nova Polska peoples. Because that's the only one group here. And... I want to do this. I want security control first. I want more stability first before we do anything else. As much as I want to do this... Oh, actually, though, anti-tank. <sighs> Negligible. Eventually, we won't be able to t do this anyways. Corruption. Actually, how much is corruption? Negligible corruption. I don't want that to get too high because that we're actually that's actually kind of nice for us. I'm going to grab stability first. Let's just grab some stability. And I do want to... Oh, cool. Um, increase corruption by a large amount, huh? Increase oversight. It's only a small amount. I'd rather get, yeah. We lose political power for now, but weekly stability. Actually, okay, so let's bring out a calculator because math is math is knowledge, right? Math is power. So 75 days can be divided into roughly 10-ish weeks. 10.7, actually. So let's say it's 10 weeks. So if it's 10 weeks, you get a whole, well, technically only get 2% stability. Is that really worth it? 2% stability. Hmm. Ooh, you know what? If it's only for that long, yeah, stability is super important for two percent more. Ooh, that is pretty, pretty. Nice. I and I always do this anyways. Two percent stability for losing twenty-five political power and point two political power for seventy-five days. Overall, that could be really, really worth it. I always do that. Screw it. We're going to improve oversight to decrease corruption by a little, just a tiny bit. I don't know. It doesn't matter too much to me, actually, so. It is what it is, and it never ends. The pantry. The planes had come during the early morning's local supply run. Local peasants carrying bags of flour into the pantry just disappeared in a cloud of smoke and debris. By the time the soldiers had dug them out, two had already died, crushing by, crushed by falling debris. The final survivor's leg had been reduced to a pulp by the building's collapse. Outside, his relatives walked as men, wailed as men to the ROA, dragged out of the unconscious body. The poor dude was placed on a cart. His family had given a few bags of food to help cushion the loss of a working, aging man. The garrison's captain reviewed his troops as they continued digging out of the pantry and salvaged as much food as possible. One recruited a young lad, a long lad, from the nearby villages looked particularly grim as he shoveled bits of concrete out in, into the yard. What a long face, soldier. It's not the first time the Germans bomb us, yes? The young man paused and saluted the officer swiftly. Uh, sir, yeah, mm-hmm. Speak. It's just that, uh, sir, the men of the village said, they said that the ROA had to deal with the Germans, that their bases were not bombed. That their bases were not bombed. The officer laughed, as this is what they say in whatever crap hole they dragged you out of, that the Germans have an ounce of mercy, that, get, that they give a crap about the old conscript army? Uh, yes, sir. Well, there's your answer. The officer gestured towards the collapsed building where the other soldiers are pretending to work. There's an answer for all of you. They are always got nothing but what we can get ourselves. Now get back to work at this pace. Your dinner will mold under this pile of concrete. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, God, no. Oh, boy. I'm not clicking on that. Nope. So take what is there. 
increase civilian morale. Apply to the common man. Get more equipment. Looking for treasure. I like that. Take what is ours. Increase military morale. The people provide. All right. The Russian people deliver us. I like that a lot. The German connection. Oh boy. Muscovine contacts. Well, well, what we're gonna choose? Let's see. Last time I played somebody who was a black league or Omsk. I think for this campaign, I usually like to ask you guys what you want to do, but I want to think. I want to think a lot, but what I think we're gonna do is go with the civilian side, just because last time I played the Russian unifier was, like I said, Omsk. Uh, maybe we'll go more democratic tomorrow this time, especially with Hadrish. If Hadrish actually succeeds, then everything's going to fall apart, probably. Actually, let's let a few days go by first. Before I want to select at least one of these before we lose political power. So, so we'll probably go the more democratic route for this campaign. Cowards among cowards. A knock came at Vlasov's door, and he looked up from his paperwork, letting out alongside. Only one person was scheduled to be seeing him now. It was time, then, for the meeting with that man. Come in, told the visitor reluctantly. It was Dmitry Zakudny. That infuriating smug smirk of his still present on his face. I've come to give my advice on the development of industry, sir. Good goodness. My goodness, Vlasov wished he could wipe that smirk off his face just once, unfortunately. He had ties with Oktan, though Vlasov doubted even that man had any love for Zakutny. No one did. They all defected, of course, but Zakutny had joined their side without hesitation. Eagerly, even, and without an ounce of for his reason for it, being ideological. He thought to himself, too good for a PW camp. A true coward among an army of cowards. Yes, continue, Vlasov said finally, as Zakutny discussed his plans for the development of defenses against German bombings and increased armament production. Vlasov barely listened, knowing his approval or disapproval of the plan mattered little in the grand scheme of things. However, when Zakutny began speaking how it was only natural that such a great plan was devised by a brilliant mind such as his own, Vlasov couldn't help but himself from slamming his fist down on the desk and standing up, shooting a seething glare towards Zakutny, causing the man to take a couple steps back. You, almost as quickly as being given in to his irritation, Vlasov cooled down, shouting at Zakutny couldn't wouldn't change anything except maybe for the worse. He had to keep his cool. It was only the thing of real value that he still had left. Sorry, please, leave me be for the day, Zakutni. With a hurried apology and thanks, Zakutni nearly ran out of the room, shutting the door behind him. Sitting down again in his seat, Vlasov let out another long sigh. Had he really been giving given up so much for this? So we're going to go ahead. I want to emphasize corruption still, but since we're losing political power anyways, um, I'm going to do this one just because I like to get actually extra anti-tank. Negligible, still 25, that's not bad. Cool. Uh, well, let's go and lose it. And take what is theirs. At the conference, Zikov and his supporters have fiercely defended their position on both ideological and coldly pragmatic grounds. Their argument goes like this. Increasing taxes on the population will drive it further away from us. And the army of national liberation can scarcely afford to lose what a few good hints of goodwill it ha still has. Accepting more German weapons is also not a good plan, as the soldiers must be seen and known as liberators of Russia, instead of being mere German puppets. Thus, the best and hardest path, according to Zikov, is to make do with what we have. This will leave us weaker in the short term, but being loved by our people and embraced by those we liberate will be incredibly helpful. I definitely want to increase civilian morale just because, I don't know, it seems like a, a good thing to do in scavenge for vehicles. Zlikov might have convinced the officer, the rest of the officer corps and his various factions not to increase supply or requisition on the people, nor supply demands to the Germans, but there's still a tangible shortage in almost everything. The most pressing concern is the ever-dwindling pool of motorized vehicles. Without much native industry and the limited export capacities, our fleet of trucks and armored vehicles melts by the day. Our men have been sent to scour the countryside for anything that might roll downhill. Tractors that peasants have given up on. Military cars and trucks have been abandoned in the wood. Whatever broken down German or Soviet tank hidden in marshes or forests. This iron harvest will be a meager one, and most of what we'll find will likely be useless. But any quantity of engine blocks and armor plates we can scrounge up will be useful for the cause. Border Patrol. The border with Samara is usually quiet. In the off-season, where the constant of small-time raids and warfare of the Russian anarchy simmer down, men can be seen discussing with fellow soldiers from across the border. So it came from a few riflemen of the Russian Liberation Army, came to drink in a small village of a contested area, where a man of the Imperial Army entered. There was a momentary tension. That too died down as the Vlasovites offered a round of drinks to the Imperials. Talks ebbed and flowed on a range of topics, a particularly violent group of bandits but that both groups of soldiers have fought with, the dudes. The reason why they're mostly bad, the news from beyond the Urals, very confused. Eventually, the topic moved to the WRRF. A few of the veterans of both groups have fought in the 50s. After commiserating on the shame of the fighting fellow Russians to defeat the Reds, the soldiers shared war stories back and forth. A few more rounds of share. This casual conversation marked the high point of the evening's mood. Eventually, a bitter dispute erupted as the legitimacy of the ROA. Had it not begun as a German militia, dogs for the invaders, the ROA veterans snapped back that the Tsar has been invited by the Germans, and that the, the white soldiers should not talk about serving tyrants foreign to, foreign to domestic. The barman did not speak. Business was good for now. When these idiots started fighting again, the bar might have to move once more. Such was life in Russian anarchy. Last call. Very cool. And let's come over here and do this. Uh, just looking at this thing. And let's go ahead because I almost forgot about it. Soup and a story. Leonid was an institution upon himself. 
Hey, they lived on the streets of Samara for almost his entire life, broken by circum mostly by circumstance, though sometimes by choice. The people of Samara knew him well, and in the district he called home, he could name almost every resident. It was rare indeed that the strangers found their way to this district. It was far from enough away from anything merchants were interested in. So it surprised him. When he entered the local soup kitchen for his lunch, he saw a strange man dressed in tattered military uniform. He sat at his table, sipping at the soup in front of him as if it was an afterthought. After he had gathered his bowl, Leonid joined the stranger. Hello, stranger. A fine day, yes? The stranger glanced at him before replying. Yeah, hello, yes. A fine day. Soup is good. The stranger's accent was muddled and foreign, and his grasp on the language was rather poor. Leonid could swear that he had heard that accent before, but for the life of him, he could not place it. That it is. Daria makes a good soup. You have the look of a wonder about you. Where are you heading? Leonid had met many of this step before. Folk who couldn't stay in one place for one reason or another. East was the man's reply. The shoulders slumped before he continued. Have business in the East. Just to atone, his voice had resigned, tired. The stranger could not understand why he had elaborated. It served little purpose, and yet he had. Lane is simply not. I understand. You know more than more than you know, I suspect. I was something of a hellion in my youth, you know? Did a lot I wasn't proud of. I can be a good pair of ears if you'd like to share. I find that talking helps, even if for only a time. The stranger looked at him fully for the first time, his eyes filled with the weight of his regrets, and began to tell his tale. It was a long tale of strife and horror. By the end of it, Leonid truly understood. His accent was German, after all. A friend in the lowest of places, if you'd like to read about refusing tribute, this happens every campaign when we play as a warlord, go right ahead, but the sounds of gunfire continue to resonate in Russia. I like this. So far, it's looking pretty good. Hopefully, this improves. By winning. It's only May. Um, are we going all the way down here? Okay, that's fine. Wow, we definitely need to get some better soldiers. Wow, these guys suck. Uh, anyone over here? No? Take what is theirs? The flight of the common man and the scavenger of vehicles? The young officer's speech? Have been short and crisp. Zykov's usual point man and tough debates with the ROA. Within the ROA's officer corps, Major General Ivanovich spoke to the assembled grandees of the ROA for his absent master. Between the monotone droning, empty boasting, and all around boredom, so come to the ROA's conferences, Ivanovich's style was refreshing in its earnest simplicity. Yes, the young man agreed. It would be unfair for the ROA's commanders and soldiers to weather even more deprivation. It would be easier to take from the peasants or to cow to the Germans for supplies. Every man with a gun west of Muscovy had found himself either doing either of those things at some point, and besides, they were already known as bootlickers and collaborators. What would they lose by forsaking the last shreds of honor and goodwill they still had? No, the men of the Army of National Liberation should be and could be better than that. Each increase in taxation bled away the army's dwindling popular support. The situation could not go forward. As of German weapons, what of them? Military surplus had then been used to massacre the motherland's children, given to them kindly by the 20th century's greatest criminals. The ROA would do better. The words of the Zekovite faction have been idealistic, yes, naive, perhaps, but they stood up from the hopeless pragmatism of Bunachenko's faction and from Oktan's weary and greed-fueled cynicism. The officers voted for Ivanovich's proposed austerity under the watchful eye of endless men. Our current supplies will have to do. So those civilian morale? Wow, look at that. Oh, they showed up. Gosh darn it. Civil rights act, all right. Civil rights? Who wants civil rights? So, looking for treasure. With well, the drain on our vehicle fleet somewhat arrested, our soldiers are moving their efforts to whatever else can be lifted and carted off to to our bases, forgotten German and Soviet supply caches, farms abandoned by fleeing or de dead peasants, down German plans, buried to gold, the pile of junk brought back to the bases is sifted through by the men. Whatever we can use is stashed away among the rest. Whatever has mo monetary values hauled to convoys headed for the Muscovy border, where black market traders will give us a fraction of its price for their troubles. Selling abandoned cuckoo clocks and teapots will not make us rich men, but anything we can trade on the black market for supplies will still prove to be of value. To cheer up the soldiers, 15% of every discovery value is given to the men directly to encourage them to search. Of course, any soldier that steals from civilians is to increase his stash shall be shot. The idea is to avoid angering them further, not to use them to patter in retirement funds. If you'd like to read about this, or a successful raid, please go right ahead, and we get a loot. A whole loot. A one loot. Nice job, soldiers. You really bloodied yourselves. Let's see. Strikes in Samara. Oh, boy. We need to get more guns. Actually, I didn't look at this at all. Um... Not bad. We only have four factories, though, of course. Artillery. We need some APCs eventually. We're going to need some support equipment. We're going to need some... We have some motorized ready. Uh, do we have anti-tank? What should we do? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> Fighters. Nope. 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 Um, sure, we'll use Dr. Bombers for this campaign. Strikes in Samara. 12 o'clock, that was the deadline for the striker site to disperse. The commander of the local garrison, Major Popov, noted that the time was 12.32, yet well past the time that the strike should have dispersed. He reiterated his troops who were observing the situation over the factories. ROA troops frequently mediated between employers and employees, especially during tense situations like this one. They asked a simple question, have they dispersed? The emperor answer Popov got was not the one he was hoping for. The strikers won't give up, the voice on the other end of the radio responded. So, worse. There's some rumors among the workers here that their managers said the strike was actually orchestrated by the communist agents' plants, as they call them. Things are getting pretty tense. <clears throat> 
People were throwing things. What came after that was really worried Mr. Major Popoff. Some of the greener troops. I think they're unnerved. If things go south, they might start shooting. Popoff cursed himself. The gosh darn strikers. It was the third time in three months this has happened, and each time it was up to the ROA to sort things out. How many times would he have to deal with this before he made his superiors understand that he and those he commanded were soldiers, not policemen? Regardless, Popoff had, made, had to make a choice. He could send in his troops to disperse the strikers and potentially kill or weed out the apparent communist plans. Sure, this would think, calm things down and set a president to the ungrateful strikers that their insubordination would not be tolerated. It might make us unpopular in the short run, but also ensure that the stability in our streets. But workers would surely be reluctant to complain if this meant being on the wrong end of the barrel of a gun. However, Popoff would still have the lives of those workers on his hands. Simpl similarly, if he refused to send in the army, the workers would be happy and alive, of course, but business interests would feel betrayed. It wasn't an easy call by any means, but Popoff knew that he would have to make it. It would be a PR disaster if his recruits lost their cool and fired into the crowds. This was no place for the army to intervene. But we must continue looking for treasure and getting more political power. My goodness. 0.64 is not really great. Oof. Alright. <clears throat> Dealing with dissent. It had not skipped Vlasov and the K-O-R-N. K-O-N-R. Leadership that our army of national liberation is widely unpopular, even among the members of our nation that we need have already liberated. Ignoring for the moment issues of the taxation, we may not or may not have exacerbated. The people of Samara disdain us as foreign stooges. Many citizens, especially among the left leaning, see us as unrepentant traitors that have contributed to the failure of the WRRF. Opinion among the obstacle were as to the best solution run from the usual gamut of proposals. It would be thus for the best to convoke another meeting of the general staff to discuss the issue. Perhaps settle on one strategy to secure the goodwill of the people, or at least the absence of their opposition. Bianca's loot. Orenberg has what? No loot. Nova Polska has none. Gwarki does have loot. Which one's Gorky? Islamic Republic? Muscovine? Oh, they're, they're over here. Nice. Looking for treasure. Oh, war in the desert. Cool. And what do we have over here? We can buy guns. I'm not really interested in doing that. We don't have that political power for this, so. No thanks. Also, what we're researching is part of our land auction and civilian construction, too, so. Maybe you didn't know what we were doing. Dealing with the descent. <clears throat> and now, we can do the smart way and get village councils. Increase civilian support even more. The easy way and do food for all. Increase civilian and military morale. Or the hard way, no soup for you. But I think for now, I'm going to do the smart way. The indefatigable Zakov has used his time as a podium at the podium to argue that the best way forward is to go at it intelligently and legitimately try to improve the lives of our citizens. Legitimacy is derived from the people's support, and our soldiers are still brothers, fathers, and sons. The men tilling the fields and buildings are no less indispensable than the men fighting for a new Russia. Enslaving a whole nation for the purposes was the mistake of the Soviet Union and the Third Reich, and now the first is long dead and the second finds itself dying. It might not be the easiest path. Fear, suspicion, and shattered hopes may push many of our citizens towards distrust. Some may never forgive us for the working with the Germans, and we will have to go the extra mile to prove our good intentions, but this problem must be solved now, lest our reputation of tyranny spread to newly liberated provinces. Scavenge for some good old loot. Beautiful. And right now, oh, news from the east. The Russian Liberation Army was nothing if not pervasive in their efforts to patrol the territory that they controlled, and that they did. Daily patrols went out, came back in. Checkpoints along the roads and troops stationed throughout the hinterland of the territory ensured that the officers and ultimately Vlasov himself knew what he was going, what was going on. As a result. It didn't take long for news of an envoy from the east to arrive at the local garrison station. The ROA was consistently wary about altars and strangers to the point where the diplomat from beyond the Urals instantly kicked up suspicion. Maxim Olinyak, the officer in charge of the garrison station that the envoy had sent or been escorted to, didn't particularly want to meet the man. In fact, he was suspicious that the man who was he claimed he be was sitting down with the envoy. <clears throat> it was clear that he was frustrated, protesting his being whisked away to, to the garrison rather than Samara itself. Olyanyak sat down with a man looking at, at him and down. Who are you, he asked, and why are you my caravan and I've been stolen away here? I am bound for Samara. The commander took a pause before responding. For all that matters to you, I am Samara. Now tell me who you are. Who are you? Some further protests were given, but the envoy soon realized that he wasn't getting anywhere. He relinquished and eventually introduced himself as a diplomat hailing from Novosibirsk beyond the Urals. The meeting became closer to an interrogation with Olyanyak, learning about the events that were going on in the east. The envoy, after the questioning was over, attempted to offer to trade with ROA. Olyanyak's polite but cold no thank you dissuaded him, and he left back to Novosibirsk soon after. We do not deal with warlords here. 
the smart way. On discontent and popular support. The assembled officers and soldiers fell silent as Mosh of Lassov walked to the podium. The old man still commanded, if not universal respect, then grim curiosity from the officers' corps. Friends of the National Liberation Army, the KONR, ever since your valiant efforts have been freed the land around Samara. Opponents to our liberation efforts have been perpetually tied to undermine our rule. Their attempts to spread discontentment has not been helped by the endless bombing campaigns and frequent economic problems imposed on the Russian people by the anarchy. As soon as time as a time to renew our efforts to free Russia approach. This opposition cannot be tolerated. The brave men of the ROA cannot march to war as the fifth column of terrorists and communist anarchists spread of chaos at home. One way or another, respect of our administration and healthy fear of breaking the law must be spread throughout our land. I convene you to this meeting so that I, that proposed solutions might be discussed and a general plan of action might be decided upon. Good luck, officers. Uh, goodbye, more guns. Raid against the Tartar. Oh, the Tartar Republic. Oh, yeah, I'll try that one. All right. Uh, let's see how strong they are. Oh, they have five to seven. Oh, that might not be good. Ooh, yeah, our guys aren't known for being super strong. Down with the traitors, though. General Zilinkov and Vasily Mal Malishkin, both leading figures within the ROA, closely associated with the Zaykov's propaganda, propaganda efforts, proceeded as they often did towards their offices. Regularly sharing a car and convoy, the two men spoke at length about their efforts for the day as well as the challenges they would work to overcome until Zilinkov suddenly shouted at the driver to stop, hastily exiting the car to the consternation of his bodyguards and other vehicles. He strode over the, to the wall where a poster he and Malinshikov had collaborated to create was hanging. Hanging to face, the words down with the traitors splashed across it in bright red ink and obscuring the message behind. Joined by Malinshikov a moment later, and with their bodyguards quickly establishing a perimeter, they inspected the poster. Exchanging a knowing look and with a wordless nod from other men, Zilinkov quickly Quickly tore it down, aware of how fortunate it was that they, not others within the ROA's high command, had seen it first. His relief was short lived, however, as Malinshikov tapped his shoulder and pointed across the street. Another copy of the poster defaced, with more of them down the streets disfigured similarly. Every single one of them, in fact. M Malishnikov, Malishkin began fiercely speaking of how they would need to summon soldiers immediately to remove them, but Z Zilinkov barely heard him. He was too busy looking at the people who had retreated at a respectable distance from the ROA bodyguards, but who still watched them closely, and that brought him nothing but worry. Because if the people were brave enough to vandalize the ROA's posters in such numbers in public fashion, what else were they brave enough to do? Oh, Vyatka or Tatar Republic. I don't like to do either one, I'll be honest. And after this, hearing out the people. Our community outreach has gotten some results despite the cynicism of most of the officer's staff. Soldiers begin to renovate roads in rural communities and helping to clear rubble. Peasants have at first been reluctant to bother the soldiers, but have a few have since coming out to seek help with other tasks. The soldiers have been obliged to most pressing ones, and as a result, quite a bit of goodwill has been founded. In parallel to this, a myriad of mixed civilian and tri military tribunals have been established. People wronged by our soldiers or government are encouraged to register the complaints with the judges. While it is out of the question to punish our soldiers too harshly, lest we lose control of the state. Ensuring that the worst excesses are penalized and aggravated citizens are comp compensated goes a long way. Another idea that is slowly gaining traction are mixed military, civilian, and community councils, where small garrisons see their organization and enmished with the village they protect. It'll be a long process, but getting the people to support and back our cause now has a good chance of actually happening. Very cool. Now let's go with agricultural methods, because that's usually the second best one to do. And we'll go with attrition planning, because, well, we're going to defend quite a bit first. Well, one. And... Oh, look at this. We got actually a okay -ish amount of equipment. If that's a case, we're making one division here, which is okay. It's not great. I'd actually like to convert one of these guys over, but we need more divisions, not better ones. So let's go do this and do that. A second opinion. The men of the village sat somber in their church, wearing the last filthy, filthy, and least bloody, so, but though still notably so, uh, of their holiday attires. Cheers have been gathered in a rough circle, centered on the strange man from Samara, leaning against the walls of an array of soldiers or weapons dangling casually from the rifle slings. Friends and brothers, you've been called to the meeting to help assist the army of the Russian liberation. It's been our hope to bring freedom and democracy to these lands under our control. Today we will come to hear from you and your kin. What are some issues you'd like to see addressed? How can we help you improve your lives, citizens? An embarrassed silence, someone raises their hand halfway before reconsidering. Not fast enough for the indefatigable friend of the people. Zaka pointed to the man. You, my friend, have something on your mind? It's just, sir, the soldiers come around for taxes, but it's never the same amount. I thought uh, we'd like to know in advance how much they need. So we can be prepared to hand it out to them, sire. Uh, Zikov nodded at this. Encouraged, a few others brought up complaints, always respectful to the soldiers of the room. Long dormant ruins that occupied their fields, bombing raids that left a good half of the village's people's homeless, mines and half-awake bombs that detonated in the night. Little by little, a picture emerged of the myriad problems affecting this here, this here village out in the middle of nowhere. The always chief propagandists would put this information to good use. A few patrols would see, should see to their needs sufficiently, and hope that the villagers would remember that the benefactor in return. A man of the people... 
Zack off. And as we did, well, as we was talking about that, repair raid against these people. I don't even know how strong they are, but I don't think they're that strong. And if we can loot other people and get some stability and guns out of it, I think that's worth it. And hearing other people. Good. Good. And we'll do our loyalty to finish out this episode, shall we? Uh, a coherent domestic policy has been chosen as a method of obtaining new equipment for our men. Now the biggest hurdle remaining to us is a little question of leadership. To some, Vlasov is a great leader, simply buried by the weight of years. For others, Vlasov is a temporary solution until the Army of National Liberation can choose its true goal and methodology. Finally, for a loud minority, Vlasov is a weak failure that is the re main reason the KONR has been rotting in Samar for an entire lost decade. As the final... As the final leadership conference then, to determine where the loyalty of our men shall fall, and to finally choose what vision of Russia the Konar is truly fighting for. Oh boy. We shall see what happens, and let's begin a raid immediately. Oh, wait, maybe we should wait. Or, yeah, our organization isn't very good. That's my fault. Hopefully they... Okay, they pay the tribute. If you like to read about this, go right ahead. Ah, we got the extra political power. Good. So, negligible, which is good. Civilian morale is still low. I think I'm going to wait and investigate corruption, maybe? So we can decrease it by a large amount. Hopefully that's like 10 or 20. And it's looking not too bad. 0.47 is obviously not great. But I want to wait. It's low. Uh, I don't want the corruption to rise. That's the main thing. Because I don't want to lose even more stability. Which would be quite unbueno. Uh, laws of the land. Increase civilian morale by quite a large amount. I like that. I'd like to loot some more. But hey, that's okay. And we shall see what happens. Shall we? And very soon we shall have it. Actually, when is this going to be done? Ah, oh, five days. That'll be good. So, we've chosen the Democratic Route, and we're going improving our industrial equipment by quite a bit, which is actually very nice. Hey, we have a division! Nice! A good old division. Investigate corruption so we can see how much this is decreases things by. Alright, so we've got 48 political power, and corruption is 25, so this does what? It lowers by 15. Okay, that's not great. But that's not bad. And the next one we'll choose is whatever we can improve our civilian morale with, or whatever, like that. So, the laws of the land. The community's new joint civilian military tribunal stood idle for quite a few days. The villagers did not trust the ROS goons to hand out a fair judgment, even the presence of a trusted men, such as the villagers' priests did not inspire such confidence. Eventually, the first test of the new legal structure presented itself. A young man had already been alleged, been found rummaging through a neighbor's pantry and had taken a bullet in the back for his trouble. The youth had survived. His family were now accusing their neighbors of attempted murder. The accused had asked the tribunal's help, as few believed his side of the story. Better risk the military's justice than waiting out a lynching. The military officer acting as a judge did a commendable job of patiently taking on both sides of the story. The jury four soldiers and five civilians didn't justify the deliberations. A non-guilty verdict for the accused was reached. The judge then imposed on the man a few weeks of community service, as well as a fine meant to pay for the care for the injured youth. All across the world, a range of issues have begun, have begun having their day in court. From criminal cases to perfectly mundane administrative topics, agreements and rulings were handed out. Grudgingly, the civilians came to trust the military's willingness to collaborate with them for the sake of law and order. Aldiator et altera pars. Apare. And our loyalty. Very good. And you know what? I'll read the next one too, just in case. Uh, just because we can, and maybe get close to finishing it up. Chasing the sun to the people. What is the KONR, if not a uh, means to an end? We should fight for the glorious liberation of Russia. What are the Germans, if not dangerous tools at best, cruel jailers at all times? We fight for a new free Russia, one not enchained by the Bolsheviks, nor one enslaved to the broken German eagle. Our legitimacy comes from the strength of our army, and the strength of our uh, support by the population. With just and wise men at the front, the Russian people should all shall rise to new heights of glory. Zikov and his faction knew that they are the best possible successors to Vlasov. The old generals fought to free Russia, and Zikov will see to it that the nation rises from its ashes, but I hope you enjoyed our very first episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I will see you tomorrow, as we shall try to reunify at least this part of Russia, and trying to be a little bit more democratic. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.